Well, hi, it's time to start. I'm uh, Ruben. This is uh, Christian Apologetics, and uh, welcome. And uh, it seems appropriate to start with a short prayer, so would you join me? Our Heavenly Father, we pray through your Holy Spirit, you'd give us the grace of clear minds, gracious communication, open hearts, that you would supply what the mind can't supply by itself, the, the power of your presence in what we think and do. In Jesus' name. Well, um, I don't know why they did this to me, and it seemed like a bad idea, but I took my assignment faithfully from Brian Hirschberger, and that was I was supposed to do three successive sessions on apologetics, and I was supposed to run the same thing each time, like everybody else got to. I was supposed to have three that went in order, but, but nobody's going to want to do that, so, so you'll get, I'll get different people in the room each time, which is what's happened here. So this is the second session, and you're welcome here. <laughs> but I don't want to go back and repeat the first session. In the first session, we talked a lot about the, the foundation of Christian apologetics, what it is, and why bother. And how does it appear in the scriptures? And what are kind of the foundations of this idea of giving a reasonable defense of the faith? What will it do for you? And how does it apply to evangelism and things like that? So we kind of covered that in the first session. And as I said, I don't necessarily want to go back into that territory. This is being recorded. And if you want to talk some other time, it's fine. But I found you do have to lay a lot of groundwork for, for apologetics. That the, the initial discussion that we've already covered uh, is very important to the discussion. Like, why are you doing this? What's the role of faith and reason? And, and why are you trying to, to speak for Christ? And how does it hide from you in the scriptures? And we talked about different things. But this one's moving on. I was saying that now we're into the, the discussions, the arguments themselves that are part of apologetics. Come on in. I think there's room. No, I don't want that there, actually. Um, as we get into the discussion of apologetics, we said, well, you know, uh, we, we, we had the discussion, well, are Christian beliefs um, possible? That might be where you have to start. I mean, are, they, are people probing you to see if your beliefs, your concepts about God are simply um, impossible beliefs? They'll probe you to see if that's true. I said, well, then we talked about, well, maybe you could establish that they're possible, that they're not logically inconsistent, that you, they're not just absurd ideas. And then you might go to probability. Are they probable beliefs? And we discussed the difference of probable beliefs. You know, uh, they're not only possible, but they're probable. They, they could be true. And then we talked about, would they be preferable, probable, probable beliefs? Would, would they be preferable to alternative explanations or ideas about the nature of these things? And then we said that the really ambitious might say, are they irrefutable beliefs? Are they just something logically or, or you know, necessary for a human being to believe this? And we said, well, at least in my opinion, Christian faith is not uh, ever in that last category that God, in order to preserve our free will and to, to establish the proper motives of the no, you can wiggle out from any argument for the existence of God or Jesus Christ or anything of the kind. There's always an escape. Now, uh, as I said in the first session, I want to make that escape as costly as possible. In other words, if, yes, you can get out of this, but what will it mean for the rest of life or what, what will be the price of, of resisting this particular thing? I said mostly uh, I'm aiming at the idea of preferable, probable and preferable. And uh, then I have to leave it at that point to the, the Holy Spirit and to that person's own development. All conversations about faith have to start somewhere. And that's where we got into this idea. And I, I had mentioned in the first session, I did not grow up in a Christian home or, or anything that, that would be understood as Christian home here anywhere. I mean, my parents would have been startled if you said they weren't Christians at that time. They weren't that, that way. But it was not... Evangelical churches and churches at, at all were not part of the, the landscape of my youth. And my family's fairly intellectual, and so when I became a Christian, my faith was sort of under assault from the very beginning. And as I said, assault was too strong of a word, but it was questioned. And my grandparents were like that, too, on both sides of the family. So I kind of grew up outside of this thing. So the discussion had to start a certain place. It'll start in another place, though, if, if, if you grow up uh, close to to Christian faith. I often like, like to think about this as a line. And you might say that 
at the very foundation of this line, if you're an evangelical Christian, is this problem of you're separated, your, your, your relationship with God is severed, broken, not what it should be. Now, when we say relationship, you have to be careful because no one can exist apart from a relationship with God, but it's not what it's intended to be. And you might say that on one side of this line is the idea of salvation, and on the other side, of course, is, you know, what do you say, lostness. You know, this, this is unsaved, the unsaved state. And uh, a lot depends on how you look at this kind of thing. Now, this is not standard vocabulary that everybody uses, but most people will talk about this, or at least a lot of people will look at this in two terms. That this line is, is a, a line that, that only God can get you across. In other words, it doesn't happen by, by human reason or understanding or human energy. Only God is capable of, of getting somebody across or through this line. You might say that's the point of salvation or the act of regeneration. Regeneration meaning rebirth, and it's an act of God, something that, that happens... Uh, by God's power, mysteriously in the life of an individual. It's one of these privileged experiences. Uh, you can't look into mine. I can't really look into yours. I and mean, we can try to find the common ground of the experience, but it's, it's about as intimate and subjective as it gets. So some people talk about that as the doctrine of regeneration. Some people would talk about this as a line of conversion. So that this happens in an instant by the power of God, and it's mysterious. This is what happens to you when you become a Christian. But up to that point, you could be in the process of conversion. And uh, uh, that it's a process. So one's an event, and one's a process. Now, this is kind of like your standard evangelical Christianity here. I mean, it's a, our understanding of, of the way things work. There would be alternative models to this, and you probably have ex seen these, of course, in other kinds of you know, presentations of the gospel, you would even have like a, a, sort of like a spiritualistic model in which uh, I've often portrayed as concentric rings in which, you know, well, God's at the center of it and you're kind of traveling across the rings as imperfectly as, as you might do that and you're, you're kind of close at times and far away at times, but there's no, there's no real dilemma. There's no demarcation line here at all. It's, it's all very very flexible and of course it's very different because in this model you're never really lost entirely you're only lost by degree and you're never really saved entirely you're saved by degree but in this one I mean that's why we have the language of being saved you know, of, of coming to Christ of changing I don't mean to be simple minded about it by any means but I think it's very very mysterious and complex but on this side of the line you have conversion and that's on this side of the line then you would have sanctification in other words, on this side of the line, you grow in Christ and your knowledge and in your, your various you know, perfections of godliness. But on this side of the line, you're converting. You're, you're moving towards something. Well, I think that's for apologetics where this works is. Like, right up here at the line, you've got the cross of Christ. And that's, of course, very... I think when, if you were in the first session, I mean, Paul's obviously trying to get all his audiences up to that place. But he can't start there with everybody. And that's what we talked about in our first session, that, that it, there, there would be an absurdity or a foolishness of starting here with the wrong audience. Why would that be? So, um, participate, please. I mean, why can't you just start there? Well, yeah, but, but what would it mean in terms of this? i got to know why I'm lost. Well, yeah. Sure, but, but the whole identity of, <laughs> of Christ on the cross and the cross and its significance are a lot. You can't talk about the Son of God if you don't have a God. You can't talk about the Son of God as, a, as an atonement <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't have a certain kind of relationship with God. You, know, you, you have to establish so much groundwork. And so what I said, so if you weren't in the first session, I mean, a lot of this groundwork was laid there. But the idea, is, of course, is where do you have to start the discussion? As I was growing up, you had to start the discussion way out here somewhere. And it, the, the foundational discussion had to take place first because it, if you just raced to this particular topic, you wouldn't, you wouldn't make any sense. 
And I remember this very clearly. I, was, I, was, I became a Christian when I was a, you know, a young teenager. But I, I remember very, I, I wasn't around Christians. I mean, that, that world wasn't there. But what little I, I heard about somebody talking about Jesus saving you, I remember just being like absolutely mysterious to me. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, you know, I, I wasn't hostile to the idea. I just didn't understand it. Jesus saves sinners. What? <laughs> what? Well, good. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. It all saves sinners. <laughs> Maybe I'll be saved. <laughs> but it didn't. It didn't have any power to me because I grew up way out here. You had the question of, is there a God? That was where the apologetics discussion had to start. And so, so you can't start there in a sense, quoting the Bible. Because why? Because the Bible is true. Well, yeah, God's word isn't God's word if there's no God. <laughs> you have to put some things in sequence, I think, in order to do that. Not that, not that I would have been hostile necessarily to the idea that, hey, that's pretty interesting what you just said, or not that it might not come freighted with power. And I think one of the things you have to stress here is that some people can move down this line mysteriously, really quickly, you know, <laughs> within minutes, you know. But for other people, I think it's very legitimately a, a question of, 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 of close examination if you're truly outside the faith. So after you ask the question, is there a God, what do you, what do you kind of, what, if you're starting to to make the conversation travel this way, what might be the next question? Which God? All right, yeah, which God? What's God like? And what would be the first set of questions about that, do you think? Well, you've already jumped way ahead, though, because you said, who is God? You said, who is he? No, I'm not. Is he, is he, what is he? Well, say, if you say he's a he, you're implying that God is a person, a personality, and not just a force. Maybe, maybe there's a God, but maybe this God's just a, sort of an incohate force that doesn't have the features of personality. If you have the features of personality, what can you possibly have then? Intentionality? Intention, purpose. Like, like, like a pile of rocks doesn't have a purpose. I mean, unless somebody puts it in there, right? Well, I assume. Unless you're like, unless you're like panpsychist and believe that rocks have power. Actually, there are pagan forms that do have that, you know, that they would have some kind of primitive intention. But, I mean, no, no Christian theist would believe that. That's the, I think that's where it really begins to, to accelerate. It's, it, is God personal? And if he is personal and he has the attributes of personality, then you start thinking of intention, will, communication, and relationship. And so, so that kind of you need to say, is, is it possible, probable, preferable that, that God is like that? Or does it make more sense to think that, well, it's kind of absurd to think that everything just exists, but maybe it exists as part of an emanation of some kind of divine force that is simply not personal. So to talk about having a relationship with it is, is kind of silly. You're, you might be part of it even, but, but you don't talk to it. You know? It doesn't work. So that, that's a really interesting one as you're coming in, is to, well, which God or what's that God like? What else might, might be along this, tr this path? So, so yeah, like, well, then, then you would have the question of then who am I? And that's sort of like, like, what am I as a being? If there is a God and he, say, God created, and that's an advanced statement right there because maybe, he, maybe he's there and doesn't create, maybe he's not he, and all that kind of stuff. You have to, you have to build this. Now, we said in the first session that, that it's often... Um, with apologetics, a lot of people just sort of assume that um, the questions aren't sincere coming from the unbelieving world. And we talked about that a little bit. I said, no, these questions that the unbelieving world asks are very important questions, and they're probing to see, does your concept of deity make any sense? Is it possible for me to believe that? Can I do that? Can I, can I be that person? And so when you're asking these kind of questions, you're not just playing intellectual games. Not if you come from my world. 
So if they ask you, can God make a stone so big he can't lift it? Or could God resign? Or could God commit suicide? Or these kinds of questions. It's not that they're just trying to see if they can stick it to you. Or you might get that person. I mean, I friends in high school would do that to you, you know. But I mean, for the most part, though, I think that, that those kind of questions could be asked very sincerely by somebody who's just saying, does the Christian concept of God make any sense? Or is it clearly a fairy tale that only a child can believe? I feel like the, the power of apologetics is to see if you can, you can uh, make that adult. It, it really distresses me when I hear... Um, uh, you know, so you say, well, you know, people come to Christ when they're like 14-year-olds, and you know, after they're 20, no one comes to Christ. And so we should redouble our efforts with teenagers. You say, well, maybe you should, but maybe you should present a gospel that an adult could believe. <laughs> You know, you know, that, that, that somebody who's been around a little longer and has serious questions uh, answers that faith. And we talked about uh, the session this morning about defection from faith and nuns and duns. I think we better answer that. These are the people the questions didn't sustain them as they stepped into further and further down into their life. The quest, the, they didn't have it. The, the, that child, that faith worked for me until I was 18. And then it ceased to work for me because it, it just it, it, it didn't it didn't have the capacity to answer these things. So study apologetics, learn this stuff if you, if you can. On this way, so you'd have the question of who am I? What's my can I have a relationship with this being? Do I have a relationship with this being? And of course, this is when Chris is beginning to suggest, well, you do have a relationship with this being, but it's not quite right. <laughs> you, know, it's, you couldn't breathe without him, uh, but you, you uh, uh, at the same time, you, 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 uh, uh, there, there could be problems. And those problems are, are very visible in the world. So what kind of problems do you start to see? Well, you see the world that's messed up, and you see your own life that's messed up, so all the different wobbling things here. So you say, well, then does this being communicate to us, and how is he communicated to us? And if you were in the first session, I said, it's a very interesting thing that if you take atheism as sort of like cold materialism, that's a fairly small group of people in the world, but they stand on this side of a line. In the first session, I said, if you're religious at all, you're standing on another side of the line saying, there's something there, there's something invisible, something of an other nature, and not only is it there if you're a religious person, it's very important. I want to know what it is. It has the explanations of life. So at that point, actually, as I said in the first session, you're standing shoulder to shoulder with Hindus and Muslims and everyone else. You're all one big happy family. It's only when you start asking the specific questions that you know, left the, the Buddhists sort of dropped out there, the Hindus and then Muslims. And as I said in the first session, again, like pretty much it's you and the Jews standing there for a while. And even then, you, you're taking another step back and you're, 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 you know, the, the gradations are, are, are developing there. So you'd have all those questions about the, the, you know, who, if God communicated to us, which communication is, is interesting. And only eventually do you get up to this place where there's a, a, a cross, you know, a word of God, a Bible, and then it begins to make sense. So I, I sort of start apologizing. There. I said, everybody has to start somewhere in this discussion. It just happened to me, my lot in life, that I had to start out there. If you grew up with, if everybody you was, are going to ever be an evangelist to as an apologist has grown up and you suspect they know everything about Christian faith, they grew up with it like you did, they went to church, maybe you can start way up here. You know, say, why are you, you know, why do you resist the, the idea of Christ on the cross? You could start there. But uh, I, I was rarely in the position growing up in, in my earlier life where I could start there. I had to kind of work my way up to that place in the discussion, and that's kind of one of my approaches to apologetics. Any questions or comments? Do you, get, do you agree with me there? I mean, that people would be along that line, very sincerely along that line. I think that's one of the, the generational problems with the faith, and especially in the Mennonite church at this point, is they're very used to people who, it's just a question of being up here by the line and, and kind of pushing the questions, you know, at that point. And uh, the rest of the world has traveled very far away from that 
at this point. Good heavens, I'm 63 years old. I mean, I was born in 1956, and I grew up in the, the bosom of a secular world. I mean, just imagine what that's like for an 18-year-old at this point. You know, I was just there a little earlier, you know, but it, it's hard to impress upon people just how secular the world has become, you know, at least in some neighborhoods, at least in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. You know, that's, what, <laughs> that's the way it was. Well, the one question I would have then, if we're going to talk about apologetics, is, well, why? Say somebody doesn't even know where to begin the discussion. Why? Why should someone care about about your religious apological, uh, you know, your apologia, your your presentation of the of faith? Like, if, if you just didn't even have a, a beginning of a foothold in the door, what? What could motivate somebody to listen to you? What they see and hear is different. Could be different. Could, if you're saying there's already a relationship, it depends on where you are with the person who's wondering what it is about you that, or what what is there, what is different. Or it could be quite the opposite. It could be a matter of debate and, and anxiety or... or uh, something that they don't want to be part of, but they know that there's something there that's different. So either way, yeah, I think the second point there is very important. In our first session, we talked about the idea, well, you have this personal testimony. But we said, and that's a very important one. And to some people, it will matter more than others. But to the average person just looking at you from the outside, there are a lot of competing claims about about differences in, in your life and different people. You know, this is a quality person. I told them all about my friend Phil Strasser, and LSD changed his life. Uh, <laughs> and it did. <laughs> it really did. I mean, it, it made him a better person. He died ultimately, but but it, it, it's uh, the idea that, that personal testimony only goes so far is depends on how believable you are. And most people in the world today are confronted with um, competing claims for personal redemption. In other words, you can go to any mosque and you can find tracts up of people who were Christians and found the true way in, in Islam. You know, and they, they finally found it, you know, or you, you can find that across the world, competing claims, and to a lot of people who are just total disbelievers, they say those claims just cancel one another out. This person claims this, this person claims that, I'm happy for them, they found their way, whatever works for them is good, but, but it, you know, it doesn't compel me to believe what, what they do. I'm trying to think of things that, that sort of start the apologetic discussion. So often it starts with kind of intellectual argument. But I think in some ways it has to start with psychological need. And uh, let me see what I have here. I wanted to... Yeah. Let's, let's look at a letter by C.S. Lewis. I thought this one was is pretty intriguing. And we'll use it as a springboard for some other things here. Anybody ever read A Severe Mercy? A really interesting book. C.S. Lewis, uh, uh, um, he's not, the, the book's by Sheldon Van Auken, but he was a, a young man. He and his wife were, were friends with C.S. Lewis and spent a lot of time writing back and forth. And this was from a, a letter uh, that, that, uh, that, that went back and forth between them. I'm not sure what happened to the PowerPoint there. This is C.S. Lewis writing to him. It is quite clear from what you say. Van Auken at this point is fairly agnostic. Uh, what you say, that you have conscious wishes on both sides. And now another point about wishes. In other words, I, I wish this were true. I mean, I, I hope the stuff with, you're talking about with God, I, I, I'd like it to be true. And he tries that. A wish may be, lead to false beliefs, granted. You could just be a, have a childish wish, you know, I wish I were this or that. Uh, a wish may lead to false beliefs, granted, but what does the existence of a wish success, suggest? At one time, I was much impressed by Arnold, he's talking about Matthew Arnold, the poet's line, nor does the being hungry prove that we have bread. In other words, just because you're hungry doesn't mean you're going to get food. But he kind of plays it with it. But surely, though it doesn't prove that one particular man will get food, it does prove that there is such a thing as food. Now, I want you to think about this as a, you know, an apologetic starting point. If we were a species that didn't normally eat, weren't designed to eat, would we feel hungry? 
That's an interesting idea, right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's a wishing this were true, but what does the wish tell us? Well, that there is something of a hunger in us. You say the materialist universe is ugly. He was looking at the world without a god, you know, the world that just exists for some mysterious reason. I wonder how you discovered that. If you are really the product of a, mu a, a materialistic universe, how is it you don't feel at home there? As if it just is all kind of random and absurd and, and unfair, and you're just emerged out of the goo in, a, in an, you know, a, an unguided evolutionary process, you should probably be quite well adapted to that environment. There shouldn't be frustrations in it. <laughs> Pesty problems about meaning in life and happiness and goals and uh, uh, fairness, you know, and injustices. This wouldn't bother you because that would be the environment you were built in. But he's saying, saying, how did you discover that if you were a product of that universe? How is it you don't feel at home there? Do fish complain of the sea for being wet? Do you get it? You know, like your goldfish thing, they think, I wasn't born for this. I, 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 you know, I see people walking around out there, outside the aquarium, they seem to be so happy. And, uh, uh, you know, here I am stuck with my, you know, my two-second short-term memory and, what was I saying? No, <laughs> yeah, it just keeps going like that. It's, do fish complain of the sea for being wet? Or if they did, would that fact itself not strongly suggest that they had not always or would not always be purely aquatic creatures? Notice how we perpetually are surprised at time. How time flies. Fancy John being grown up and married. Can hardly believe it. In heaven's name, why? Unless indeed there is something about us that is not temporal. Do you get the power of what he's saying there? Do you grasp it? There was a... Is it clear? I don't want to belabor the point. If it's really clear, I'll shut up. Are you grasping what I'm saying? It's an adaptation. It's evolution. Yeah, well, and? Yeah, I don't know if there's an, like, that defeats it or not, but I found myself at times really compelled by this and other times not. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't always work no, for you? Well, at other times it feels like uh, those kinds of, like, if you can show that all of those impulses are, um, Yeah, so it seems to me like that, that puts a lot of purpose and intention in the evolutionary process. Uh, this is one thing I've found in, in uh, my discussions with this uh, is to, um, for instance, with creation and evolution and some of the very specific Christian beliefs, I, I leave those completely out of the discussion. I feel like um, I, I try to use them very much to my advantage in the sense of it seems like so often... Um, discussions about things that would evolve in us imply intention, purpose, and motive that has to come from outside a cold system. Like, all right, why, why, am, I mo why am I in motion toward these things? You know, what would produce that hunger in me unless it was going toward an end or toward a purpose? And if it's saying even the purpose of continuing to survive, that seems to reach out beyond the immediate power of cells to perceive that that's what I need to do. You get me? Yeah. Okay. Well, what would be the needs, I think, of a, of a person um, sort of uh, uh, coming into things? I think there might be three needs that you might consider kind of are in the human psyche uh, that you might want to uh, think about here. Think about this. Um, so Augustine, the, the famous you say. You stir man to take pleasure in praising you because you have made us for yourself. And our heart is restless until it rests in you. He's talking to God. Agree with him? A built-in restlessness in the human soul that is, is reaching for something that might make somebody want to listen to a person who's got an answer for that. Um, so you agree with Augustine. Do you agree with um, Aristotle? All men by nature desire to know. And we'll assume he meant women too. Yeah. So we can agree with Augustine and Aristotle. So that would probably say that as human beings, I mean, I, I don't know if you can prove these things, you know, but I think, I think it's 
take it to the bank, so to speak, is that, that we're being driven by a need for meaning. And what, what do I mean by meaning? Yeah, uh, purpose, right? Purpose in our existence. Do we just exist? Or, or is there something to our existence? There's a great uh, um, the line by uh, uh, Bertrand Russell. Are we just a fortuitous combination of atoms <laughs> that will dispel at our death? Or is there something about us that is, has more significance than that? That's more than just some atoms that, that manage to cluster up in a cold universe and have no point. So I think, no matter what you conclude about that, I think, how could a human being escape that question about meaning? Another then would be transcendence. What do I mean by that? Yeah, and I think that's what I say about religious ideas, is that idea that, that on the other side of the line of all religious faith is, like I said, materialism, there's nothing really transcendent. There's only the material world. But we're not simple-minded about material. I mean, there are forces and fields and all the, the stuff of modern physics there. But still, there's nothing other than the universe. Whereas the transcendent, the, the religious person, there's something beyond, something different, something transcendent, something out there that matters. Now, you have to ask, is, is that a question? Is there such a thing as transcendence? And then the other sort of the Aristotelian thing of understanding. I think those are three three drives that, that are driving the human being, questions that might start the discussion as to uh, uh, apologetics. That you can assume that a human being possesses these, this, this innate curiosity about these things. Now the question is how fast can you rush somebody along those lines? Well, if you're an evangelist, I guess it depends a lot on the individual, right? I mean, you, you can't necessarily take them right down to the cross in one discussion. But, but I would say these would be three starting points in a discussion that, that would employ apologetics to work with uh, um, human need, sort of the idea of a God-shaped vacuum or, or a heart that's restless till it finds rest in God, that these would be the three things that stir it or create that vacuum. Well, yeah, because, yeah, wouldn't you? Some are more fundamental. All right. Well, let's, let's look at kind of at the, at the very heart of apologetics. There are, there are three arguments you have to kind of know about if you, if you want to do apologetics, um, I think. And they, they have big names, but, but don't be scared of big names because they, 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 they're easily explained. One would be the cosmological argument cosmological argument. And one would be then its sort of, uh, its helpmate, the teleological argument. Now we'll talk about those in a moment. Almost all apologetic discussions, the, no matter where they start, are going to come down to these two heavy hitters in our corner. So if you, it's like a boxing match, you'd say, in this corner, representing the CMC, you know, in the red trunks, so, you know, never defeated, cosmological argument, you know, in a tag team match with the teleological, uh, you know, assistant. Coming out of the other corner is what? Problem of evil. Problem of evil, right. And in the other corner, you know, clearly wearing, you know, whatever the vicious things are people wear in corners that are, you know, coming from the other side, you have the problem of evil. It seems like so often apologetics discussions end up in a, in a, in a wrestling match between these two these two issues. So let's talk about all of them. Now I was going to preserve and said I was supposed to do sequential studies here so I wanted to really uh, uh, save the problem of evil for the last one because it is in a sense the. I think for most people when we're talking about meaning, transcendence and understanding it's going to be the place where the conversation really starts to, to get tight, get, get hard. So let's talk about what's happening down at this end. What is the cosmological argument? Something exists. Yes, existence itself. Now, 
I, I can, like I said, I didn't grow up Christian, so I think this, this, this is, I think once again, I'm not for everybody, this could be valid, that the one really unsolvable problem for atheism, the one that ought to make the atheist doubt, and, and if you have atheist friends you know, they have their doubts too, and they'll admit, I suffered from doubt. You know, I, I, what will make you wake up and make your palms sweat that maybe you're wrong in your atheism? It's the idea that anything exists as opposed to nothing at all. Not just a reorganization of something that already exists. So it's a, Big Bang theories are weird because, I mean, in some ways, I guess at, at their very heart, some people suggest that, that nothing exists and comes something comes from nothing. I'm not much of a physicist, so I'm not quite sure, but I think they're faking it. Uh, I, if you're a good scientist, tell me. I, I, I just think, no, you're saying something exists there because something comes together for some reason to explode into the Big Bang. I mean, I, I don't see how nothing could be on the other side of that, but uh, if you're brilliant, tell me. I, I, uh, I'll learn. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I stressed in the first session is that nobody needs an unbearable know-it-all as an apologist. It is not an idea of finding uh, silver bullets that shoot down all points of, of lack of faith. But it seems to me that the idea that anything exists at all is a real problem. And not one that you can blow off, right? Because of that need for understanding. So that you could have somebody say, well, that's an unanswerable question. It's an absurd question. Well, what's so absurd about it? I want to know why anything exists. Why is anything here at all? And it doesn't have to be something that's complex or beautiful or wonderful. I mean, uh, you've heard the old watchmaker argument, for example. It's pretty limited, but you know, the idea of uh, William Paley, he was a, a British uh, uh, clergyman and, and you know, a philosopher, and he you know, had the, found the watch on the beach, right? And so, you know, to suggest that this just appeared for no reason with all its complexity and stuff as an absurdity and things like that. Well, it's, it's a strong enough argument, but it, it, it doesn't need to be a watch. I mean, just, there's a beach there, you just picked it up off. There's sand on it, just one little grain of sand. Why is it there? And that wouldn't only be a question of why is it there, but it also implies something else that's kind of interesting. Can you think of it? It's so, why does it know that it's there? <laughs> well, it might not know if it's an immaterial object, unless it's said we get there. Well, the thing is, everything that, that's there, you, you might say that, that the cosmological is that the things that, are, things that come into existence have an explanation. In other words, if, if there's no reason for it to be there, there must be an explanation for its coming into being. And that would be kind of a foundational part of the cosmological argument, that, that they were, uh, I think Leibniz called it the, the probable cause, right? Or, or uh, universal explanation, the idea that things that exist have a reason for their existence. But it goes even beyond that, which is, well, where did it come from? Well, yeah, what is that cause? But there's another one that's kind of interesting that people well, don't often think of. What always fascinates me is how does everything intertwine the inner relationship and everything fills a niche? Oh, yeah. Need. Oh, yeah, but you're way ahead of the script at that point. You know, because that gets, I'm still with a grain of sand here. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing else. You know, little little thing, whatever it is, you know, whatever the, 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 the ultimate final... <laughs> You know, little particle is, whatever it is, you know, neutrino or whatever we're dealing with here. Well, you have the question of um, why does it exist? How does it come into existence? How does it get here? But you have also the question is why is it still here? This is the part of it that, that often gets left out of the cosmological argument if people don't know. is like, just because something comes into existence then, if there's no reason that it has to continue to exist, why does it continue to exist? So, so you could say, well, it came into existence, but something must sustain. So you'd have not just a cause, but a sustaining cause for anything in existence. How strong of an argument do you think this is? Because, you know, obviously we're heading towards God here, aren't we? I mean, we're assuming we're all Christians. <laughs> we're, you know, we're... we're Heading to God here, like, well, what is possible? What could possibly bring something into existence and keep it existing? And it would have to be something that was completely outside of the system, right? And this is what Paul drives at in, in Romans, right? That it can't resemble 
four-footed creatures and things in this world, it must in some way exist in a way that's truly transcendent, be outside of time, be outside of, of, of the whole thing in order to make it happen. If it's just another one in the series, then you have a problem of an infinite regress and you start asking who God's parents are. We'll have to talk about that. But um, I, I often hear people's um, responses, well, if you can decide that you know, God is just eternal and has always been, why can't we decide that matter is eternal and has always been? And then the Big Bang happened, you know, somehow. So, like, I guess that's often the response, and I'm not sure what the cost of that is. Mm -hmm. choice is, right? I mean, you're just choosing to say, no, matter has always been here. Since there's matter now, it has always been. Um, I don't know where to go from that. As John Gerson had, the, the matter with matter is that it matters. Uh, uh, it, you know, yeah, it, it, uh, why does matter exist internally? Doesn't it, doesn't that just sort of leave you still with the question? Now, it does get into something Ralph's going for. Somebody, so, I was just going to say, Earth probably yeah. So this guy's pretty strong. Yeah, he did. Um, well, but I don't know if the eternality of matters, a, a, you know, satisfies my quest for meaning, understanding, and transcendence. It seems to me that the, just suggesting that matter exists as an eternal property then runs into some other problems. But we'll we'll get there. As I said, I feel all arguments are resistible. I just want to raise the price, you know, of, of believing that. One of the ways that happens is um, this argument, the teleological argument. So cosmological, you get the word cosmos, you know, like, co you know, what, what's there. The teleological argument comes from this idea of the telos. That's a word for the final, the, the end, you might say the purpose. But what it boils down to is order. Uh, you know, for, for in a modern argument. Like I said, it, I mean, the word telos doesn't mean that exactly. It means kind of, but there seems to be intentionality, that it's going somewhere. So even Aristotle believed there was like an unmoved mover and having to put things in motion so that they, something has to start the flow, right, of, of that material process. And say, where does that intentionality come from in matter? Because as far as we know, anything in matter is uh, like, we said we could have a relationship with God. You don't have a relationship with a pile of bricks. And, and it doesn't seem that bricks seem to have any self-starting motivation in them. You're like, I think today I'll build a house. Let's get started. You know, it's a long way from this pile over to that. You know, it, it, does, it doesn't seem to be there to us. It doesn't seem possible, really, that, that mere matter has intention or goes anywhere. And that's where the teleological argument comes in. Now, it gets very developed. It becomes the argument from design, purpose, what you're saying. How does this all fit together? Not only because, not only do we have matter, but we have matter that seems to have intention and purpose and all kinds of, of uh, uh, complexity. It needs to be there. How so? There needs to be sand. There needs to be air. There needs to be oxygen, all this stuff. Why? Has to be there to intertwine. Well, I can kind of imagine a god who would just create the sand pit. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it seemed like it would need to be there if, if you're going to talk about what we actually see around us. A, a, a conscious beings with moral purpose that, that somehow or other that has to get there. And, and so that's where the power of the teleological argument is, is order and design uh, uh, that could, could matter explain that for a person. And so, so this, this gets really uh, very interesting with the teleological argument because it goes from everything from just simple order, like why don't the planets collide, you know, or you know, why can you sit in a chair and it still holds you up and those kind of things. But it comes right down to like the arguments for beauty. Why is there anything beautiful in the world? Or, you know, why is there any sense of purpose? Why even the, the arguments from morality are usually kind of rooted also in, in teleological arguments like this. So the idea, of course, is that, that uh, the, there's an order and it implies intention and design. What happened to that particular argument in history? An argument from design or order. What? 
What's that? You, you have the questioning right from the beginning of the first. Okay. So keep keep going. I uh, I'm not. Yeah, I'm just the questioning of just wanting to know, wanting to understand. Yeah. One of the th- what we'll find in the history of apologetics is the cosmological argument doesn't move. Nothing's going to change that. I don't think. I mean, it, you know. I, if we're you know if we were to live a thousand years from now, the cosmological argument should still make an atheist's palm sweat. The teleological arg- argument comes and goes a little bit. Uh, it, it finds its weakness because somebody finds an explanation for order that doesn't seem to need an intentional kind of creator type cause. What was the big one in our time? Evolution, Evolution of course. Now, and I don't. I mean, to a certain degree, evolution's irrefutable as, as something that's happening in the biological world. I mean, the biologist friend of mine told me, uh, you know, he can, he can make a few generations of fruit flies evolve in, <laughs> in a couple weeks, you know, if he, if he wants to do it, or goldfish or whatever. I mean, you can manipulate uh, things so that, that, you know, you can see evolution happening. But uh, the question now is, can it, can it explain the bigger uh, elements here. But Darwinism really did take down the teleological argument in its day. Because suddenly somebody seemed to have a theory, a mechanism by which there could be order and design in the universe without having necessarily any kind of intentional purpose from like a creator outside the system. What were you going to say, Mike? Um, There's a difference between microevolution and macro. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not a macroevolutionist. I, I, I'm all for microevolution. I, I, I hope I hope a lot of it's happening all the time. Otherwise, we wouldn't have compost, you know, or, or better coffee or anything. You know, I mean, just you know, I, mean, I, I hope that's happening. But I, I don't, uh, you know, the idea can this explain order in the universe? At the foundation of the, the Darwinistic argument was the idea of the belief of random change, right? Random genetic change. Uh, genetic inheritance. In other words, you know, something finally, you know, a fish sprouted wings. I mean, I, I don't mean to parody it. It's very easy to beat up Darwin. I mean, he, he's been dead for a long time. I mean, these arguments have gotten very sophisticated biologically, and you can't dismiss them real quickly. But at random genetic change, you had genetic inheritance, and then you had survival of the fittest. In other words, it's somehow or other this fitted creatures for, for survival. And so, so those were the kind of the three foundational elements of all Darwinism. There were a couple other ones. One would be kind of um, uh, um, non-organic re- origins of life. In other words, somehow a, a, a rock did develop consciousness. Don't ask why. I mean, he doesn't have an answer for that. I mean, there's no answer for that in the evolutionary process, I don't think. Uh, uh, but you'd have uh, uh, inorganic origins of life, and you would also have uh, 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 common descent, although th- there are evolutionists who don't believe in common descent. Generally speaking, you, you've got to start with kind of some level of amino acid, you know, to some kind of life to more life. It's sort of coming down this way. I guess there were evolutionists who kind of felt there might be separate channels that, that bring that down to us, but I think they're outnumbered. If you're a biologist, please correct my face, because I, I don't, I'm not. I think I know this. Well, anyway, this, this, this one got tough. Uh, the teleological argument really had to reel over this one, try to find a way to sort of get around that. It's very interesting that we live in a time in which a challenge back to, to this has been particularly strong. Do you know what that is? I'm going to speculate. Young Earth? Well, there's that. I don't know if the creationists have done it, but the the intelligent design people, the ID people, the idea of uh, um, what they call it, uh, um, irreducible complexity in a system kind of throws a wrench into the works of it. whether that's good science or not, I can't say. I'm not a scientist. But I'll say this. For, as a, as a, teleolo- a reformulation of the teleological argument, perhaps resistible in a way that scientists don't like, it's very strong. And, of course, there have been lots of people who notably kind of found it to be the place that has made them reconsider. I, I think you get that with Francis Collins, right, and Anthony Flew, and any number of other people. That This particular argument seemed to, to put a wrench in the works. 
I can't argue about it scientifically. I, mean, I, I think it gets into stuff that you'd need an advanced degree to really evaluate. I think I don't need to get into it scientifically, though, because I think philosophically it's at the very least a good restatement of teleological principles that's caused a lot of people to back up and think about whether the Darwinian scheme is, is probable. I don't have the answer to this, but I'm confused as to how they don't differentiate between adaptation and becoming. Mm. You know, I can fully understand all the ad adaptations that go on with things, but for them to become, like you said, you know, when did a rock start having intelligent thoughts? Uh, yeah, well, anybody got a theory? Well, not, not even when, but why. I mean, at the, at the foundation of it, I mean, this is the, this is the limit of, of scientific argumentation, I think, is science is brilliant at answering what, I think, but, but I mean, it, it's why is always locked into a, a, a product of induction that, that has to, to go back to something else that can't ultimately describe purpose. It, it's trapped in a, in a cycle of, of induction. You know, you know the difference between induction and deduction, right? Deduction, deductive arguments are irresistibly true it, or indu indisputably valid if, if the premises follow the conclusion. Induction argu inductive arguments, and science is built on induction, is you add up the case. You've got this case, this case, this case, this case. You draw a conclusion from it. And so, so all of science rests on inductive argument. Now, the, the trouble of, with it is, or its limitation, it, I love science. I mean, it does cool stuff. I mean, you, you don't want to live in the pre-scientific era. But the problem is, of course, somebody might find a way to add that they added the columns wrong, and they need to be readjusted. So you end up with a different conclusion. I mean, you get, get kind of things like that. Or new data interferes. You know, you discover the thing you didn't know existed. So you know, I always talk about black swans and white swans. I don't know why that's always the, the example in all the books. You know, like all the swans in the world were white. So you know, you saw white swan one, white swan two, three, four, five, six. All swans are white. And then somebody found a black swan. You know, and then, well, I guess not all swans are white. You know, so you have to come up with something else. You know, and that that was sort of the limits of induction. But induction's also always built on on kind of a time frame, right? I mean, it. it Induction is only true to the next step. I mean, it, it, or it only has its power to the next step, you know, or, it, or, or from the previous step. I mean, it, I'm not expressing it well. There's no logical reason the sun has to come up tomorrow. Now, you believe the sun's going to come up, and I believe, you know, well, you know, we believe the earth will turn and all that stuff. I mean, you know, all, the, all the adjustments we need to make to, to satisfy the critic. But, but there's no force that says it has to. Logically, it might have always happened that way, but you're, it always happened that way because you, you, you only have the experience you have. I was talking to Mike earlier, and we talked about Bertrand Russell's chicken, right? The, the chicken that, that thinks uh, the world is a wonderful place. Uh, every morning the farmer comes out and feeds me and uh, uh, has no reason to believe in its little chicken existence that, that uh, the farmer will come out and feed him every day, and it's a wonderful barnyard. But then what happens? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the farmer comes out and wrings the chicken's neck. You know? well, inductively, that was just absolutely certain, a law of physics that would never change until that morning when the, the, the neck got wrung. You know? And I say, well, that's, that's always, of course, the, po the, the limit of induction. It has no, no predictive logical force. It only works on probability, but probability is only probability. And it's always built of only what you've already known up to that point. And there have been lots of places in history in which it all fell down. You know, like suddenly, it, oh, it isn't that way, is it? I mean, there, there happens to be another world there, and Columbus just sailed into it. <laughs> That kind of thing. No, you get this is kind of interesting stuff, I think. I have just a little bit of time. I wanted to show you one other thing. Um, let me find another PowerPoint here. As I said, I wanted to preserve my last class for the, uh, um, the problem of evil, so I don't want to go there quite yet.
I wanted to look at this thing because a lot of people find this one a really interesting one um, in apologetics. It's another C.S. Lewis thing. You've heard of the old Lewis dilemma, right? This, this gets used a lot in apologetics at this point. This is running ahead a little bit. I'm, I'm sure you've seen this before. I am here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things Jesus said would be, not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make the choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit on him and kill him as a demon. You can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not let that open to us. He did not intend to. Now, I, I bring this up because I think one of the reasons when we say, say is how do we know anything about God of the cosmological and teleological arguments? Well, maybe he's revealed something of himself. And of course, a Christian's going to say, and maybe Jesus is where we're going to go here, because we think he is giving us authentic revelation and picture of God. And so the Lewis dilemma is, of course, running ahead a little bit here from, from where we were. But what do you think of this one? We've got four minutes. I don't know how much I can explain with it, but personally, I find this one of Lewis's, like, I don't know, weaker arguments. You know, whatever he talks about, apologetics and all that kind of stuff, because it seems to me that, like, maybe it's not just a trilemma. Like, maybe there's other possibilities, or, you know, we're not in the same culture and setting, and, you know, have, we don't have the same meanings to words that, you know, Jesus may or may not have had. Um, it, it's always, I think, a sign of a sharp mind when somebody says it's either this or that, and that person says, not necessarily, maybe it's this instead. <laughs> you're saying, he's telling you A and B, and you're saying, well, maybe there's C and D and E. <laughs> here. And that, that's why I think some people have said, I remember reading an atheist blog that said, this is rhetorically strong and logically weak. Uh, it's not, it is rhetorically strong. It does make people think about Jesus and, and what you say about Jesus, particularly in the context he was in, 1940s England. But it, it, you know, in the modern world, it does say, like, well, wouldn't there be other possibilities here? And, uh, uh, you know, maybe Jesus was sincerely mistaken. How would you get away from that? Don't you also have to presuppose that we have an accurate record? So we have an accurate record? Oh, you'd have that, yeah. Well, we have to get to the script, yeah. We need to stay here tonight and talk about the rest of the argument and why the scriptures are valid. Uh, well, I think the idea, of course, is that, that uh, um, often what the case goes back to, well, he, he could be morally mistaken. That would be one... That he would be sincerely mistaken and even effective as a religious leader because we have effective religious leaders who we believe as Christians are mistaken. Mohammed, Joseph Smith, I mean, these were all very effective people, apparently. I mean, they weren't crazy in the sense that they weren't able to, to lead big movements and draw a lot of attention to themselves. But I think where people would go from this is say, could a, the sincerely mistaken person perform the miracles Christ performed and in particular rise from the dead? How so? Uh, elaborate. For, who, for him, for Jesus. I mean, we, we can say he can say whatever, but it's not only what he said, it's what, what was witnessed and testified and the evidence of. Yeah, what he did. What he did legitimizes what he said about what he was doing. <laughs> That's how that goes. Than, which is more than man. So yeah. he was speaking of something that was more than man. Mere man. Mm-hmm. I apologize. I have to quit. I feel like we're just 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 beginning, but uh, it's like time to end, right? So uh, thanks for coming. I, this is supposed to be three successive things. I'm going to do another session that's going to be mostly on the problem of evil. But uh, thanks for coming. Appreciate seeing you all.